It's Monday. It's February 28th. And the word of the day is caulk, meaning a soft, putty-like substance used to create a waterproof seal. Used in a sentence, suck my caulk, Wordle. I didn't come here to be challenged. I come to Wordle to feel like a genius for knowing how to spell fruit and pants, which <laughs> incidentally is a real hate letter received last week by the New York Times. Amazing. I am no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm Andrew Torres, and broadcasting delayed from America's far center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, will you crane our necks trying to make World War III funny? Mm -hmm. <sighs> we'll find out if Katanji Brown Jackson's been boofing with Squee. <laughs> and Elon Musk will uh, feel shame? Uh, maybe. Stay mm. tuned. <laughs> <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Eli Bosnick and Andrew Torres. Gentlemen, are you ready to neither confirm nor deny the rectal extraction rumors about why Heath is unable to join us this week? Uh, I, I'm the one that's supposed to be telling you guys that you can neither confirm or deny various rumors, remember? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. okay. Just, well, now that our legal counsel says it's okay, Heath pulled off his own butthole as self-punishment <laughs> for missing yesterday's Wordle. Okay, so knowing Heath, he'd be far less upset about the rectal extraction rumors than the he missed the Wordle slander, okay? <laughs> exactly. In our lead story tonight, podcasts are a terrible place to go for current events type shit. We generally write our stories on Friday or Saturday. We record them on Sunday. You hear them on Monday. So anything I can say about the current state of the Ukraine invasion will obviously be dated by the time you listen to this. Suffice to say, Vladimir Putin continues to be a 1980s action movie villain and no eccentric billionaire with a background in robotics has yet shown up to complete the equation. Uh, spoiler, wait for my second story. <laughs> our, st our fucking timeline has the worst Batman. But to be clear... Normally, I try to avoid cartoonish caricatures when discussing the complexities of international politics, but Vladimir Putin is pretty much exactly the Queen of Hearts from Disney's rendition of Alice in Wonderland. So, like, either you lean into cartoonish caricatures or you pick a non-Putin story. Yeah, yeah. I always thought it was weird that they cut that part where the Queen of Hearts poisons Alice with uranium from the movie. But I, Polonium. It, I, it, I know, and also the one where she rides the horse shirtless, uh, <laughs> preferably to the tune of never by the band art I, this may just be in my head i'm sorry you're right they, they, i i undersold him with that comparison jesus christ <laughs> it's worth noting here that the invasion comes as a surprise to exactly nobody right like putin has been amassing forces along the ukrainian border since november and for months american intelligence has employed the strategy of just standing next to putin and yelling all the shit that he's about to do right before he does it um, and that's actually been kind of funny, and it may have forestalled the invasion by a bit, but on Wednesday, the long telegraphed invasion began, and, and because American officials have been saying shit like, he's going to stage a fake attack on Monday, right here on the map, uh, Putin has had to rethink his justification for the invasion quite a bit, and ultimately decided to go with, and correct me if I'm wrong, because fuck your mama. Yep. Yeah. No. Right. But but the flimsiness isn't much comfort to the Ukrainians being crushed under the foot of his army, of course. Yeah. It's also been a little embarrassing to the pro-Russian stooge contingent of the Republican Party, uh, which I like to call the Republican Party, uh, mm -hmm. that has been attempting to lay the groundwork for justifying this invasion for the past month and a half. Yeah. yeah. I have been informed with my advisors that the only person who would believe me are the Fox News puppets that I already control. So, uh, yeah, three, two, one, World War Three. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, right, right, right. I declare a nuclear war. <laughs> um, of course, once a malicious foreign actor actually threatens the near century long peace in Europe, the fractured U.S. political system was able to draw together to condemn this deadly aggression. Just kidding. Uh, Trump called it brilliant republicans in congress blamed biden for it and tucker carlson defended putin by pointing out that at least he's not calling republicans racist and trying to get him canceled podcast listener uh if you're one of the few mutated roach people who survives the fallout will you write at least he wasn't canceled next to tucker carlson's charred corpse for me? <laughs> <laughs> i would appreciate it do, do, i'll be dead <laughs> do you guys remember that episode of futurama where fry chased the giant brains through literature before finally trapping them in the book of his own making like <laughs> a book full of plot holes and spelling errors that resulted in the giant brains just giving up and leaving for no reason right yes yeah 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Th- if that book were written by Kyle Rittenhouse, that's the world we're trapped in. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now, to be clear, Trump has long since put the Republican Party in a bind vis-a-vis Putin. His naked sycophancy over the last half decade has forced damn near every elected official in the GOP to go on record about Putin not being that bad, or like, or at least you know looking the other way when Trump agreed to trade him state secrets for fucking garbage pail kids straight up at yeah, some now, point. Now, but bear with me, Noah. What if it had been NFTs of garbage pail? <laughs> But the pro-Putin imperative was kicked up a notch when Trump's immediate reaction to the invasion was to go on a podcast, call the invasion genius, wonderful, and very savvy, and then characterize Putin as a peacekeeper and dubbing his army, quote, the strongest peace force. Adding, I'm not fucking kidding, quote, we could use that on our southern border, end quote. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so faced with the most popular figure in their party pining for an invading Russian army on our southern fucking border, Trump loyalists in the party were lining up to make a fidget spinner out of Reagan's corpse. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, to be fair, so am I, in that I want to put my fingers inside it and I want it banned from classrooms. (laughs) (laughs) Now, to be fair... I should point out that some Republicans actually did manage to condemn the invasion without blaming it on Biden. Uh, Maybe even most of them. I don't know. (laughs) That's the kind of thing these assholes get credit for at this point. Right. But there are also plenty of jackasses like Elise Stefanik, the third ranking Republican in the House and the person that took over as the chair of the House Republican Conference when Liz Cheney had the temerity to oppose dictatorial overthrow of democracy. Uh, She spent way more of her statement on the invasion condemning Biden than Putin. Right. Steve Bannon praised Putin for being anti woke and not flying pride flags. Uh, Charlie Kirk blamed Biden's energy policies and literally asked, quote, unironically, quote, could it be that Greta Thunberg and Leonardo DiCaprio actually might be to blame for what Vladimir Putin is doing? Uh, yeah. Vladimir Putin would totally be the kind of person who didn't like to look up. I get it. I no, that's it. true. That's yeah. probably true. <sighs> But, of course, nobody lined up to take a bigger mouthful of Putin's pudding than Fox News' number one rated host and guy whose physical appearance isn't worth commenting on ever again since nobody will ever do better than Heath's perpetually confused soda jerk line, yep. Tucker <laughs> yeah, Carlson. Uh, on the eve of the invasion, he did a whole monologue about how Putin's not so bad. He then went on to expound on a surprisingly exhaustive list of bad things that Putin hasn't done, uh, which included... Such diverse inactions as not shipping middle class jobs in his hometown to Russia, not manufacturing a worldwide pandemic that wrecked his business and kept him indoors, not teaching Tucker's children critical race theory and not trying to snuff out Christianity. Now, he did try to backpedal a bit from this when less than 24 hours after that flagrant endorsement, Putin declared pseudo war on Ukraine and started indiscriminately bombing people. But he also condemned the violence at the January 6th insurrection once upon a time. So who the fuck knows how long any of that's going to last? Did did anyone else have a moment of like genuine relief when you saw that speech? Because I did. I was like, Oh, he's a Russian spy. Fun. It was like a twist in a bad movie, except I live it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 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 just to rain on your parade, license. one of our two major political parties is now the National Gaslighting Party. I expect that in about two months from now, we'll all hear on the floor of the Senate stories about how these were patriotic Russian tourists and yeah. any actual <laughs> violence in the now occupied Kiev would be due to false flags by Antifa and Black Lives Matter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, much like the Ukrainians looking to America for aid and seeing Republicans, you might also be in need of better help. So we're going to pause for a word from this week's first sponsor. Ah, self-care. Hey, Eli, what you doing? Oh, you you didn't hear my little pre-sketch dialogue? I'm doing uh, self-care. With a a bubble bath? That's right. Letting all my stresses melt away in this here bubble bath. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. Bubble baths seem nice, but... Weren't you telling me the other day you were really struggling with your mental health? I sure am, but that's that's why I'm having this bubble bath. Ah, 
So self care, S- self care. Yeah, no, I heard that. But you know, just like going to a doctor is an important part of taking care of your body, talking to a licensed professional therapist is an important part of taking care of your brain. I don't know, Noah. I bought these bath bombs online, and therapy seems like uh, a whole thing. Well, why don't you just try BetterHelp? What's BetterHelp? BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anybody on camera if you don't want to. So I could do therapy in a bubble bath? I mean, I guess so. I probably shouldn't advertise that, though. I don't know, Noah. It sounds expensive. Actually, BetterHelp is much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. All right, Noah, thanks. Well, I'm staying in. I was going to ask why you were in the bath, too. I mean, you could take care of yourself and others at the same time, Noah. Yeah, Noah, jeez. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in running in place news, we learned that President Biden's next Supreme Court nominee will be Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She's replacing retiring Justice Stephen Breyer, 83, who is one of the three members of the Supreme Court's sanity wing. So, you know, the Supreme Court won't be getting worse in the foreseeable future, which, Hmm. you know, counts as a victory in any timeline that's set later than November of 2016. Oh, dude, every time I eat something other than fried glow-in-the-dark rat beneath the steel gray sky of a nuclear winter because Trump thought that button was for the Diet Coke feels like a victory now. Yeah. 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 And in my defense, when that happens, I was already eating that way and I live in New Jersey. So when right, win, yeah, win, that's win. true. No, fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to admit something here, right? We, we, we know that President Biden promised to pick a woman of color as his first Supreme Court nominee. And whenever you're dealing with a diversity hire, you know, you're going to have to make certain compromises. So to get a black woman on the court, President Biden had to bypass a more traditional choice, right? Someone that's run in the same circles I've run in since high school. Really true. And frankly, someone who has the kind of mainstream credentials that belong on the nation's highest court. Uh, before you go on, Andrew, I feel like I should tell the listeners that Andrew is not talking about himself. His SCOTUS dreams died the day he met us. Yeah. Oh, God, I remember that. Someone stuff. dies in my SCOTUS dreams, too, Andrew. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> as as if to prove Noah's point. <laughs> no, look, this person is not me. It's someone I actually saw in person way back when I was a sophomore in high school. I was attending nationals for speech and debate, and this person won all of you know nationals. So winning nationals almost always gets you into whatever college you want. They picked Harvard. They graduated at the top of their class. They started Harvard Law School the year before I did. Same as you know my buddy Ted Cruz. Uh, while at Harvard Law, they were of course on the law review. They graduated with honors. They racked up three different federal clerkships, including one on the Supreme Court before going into private practice. Okay, look, I'm obviously going to stop because these are obviously Katanji Brown Jackson's qualifications. The fact that she has pretty much the exact same resume as neil gorsuch and uh, a significantly more impressive one than amy coney barrett Mm -hmm. has not stopped the right wing from conducting its usual very loud whisper campaign that brown jackson is simultaneously not not that bright i have heard people say i've heard not that bright but also some kind of you know frisé eating chardonnay latte drinking ivy league elitist to be fair I'm more qualified than Amy Coney Barrett, and I've also attempted to kill less Supreme Court justices than Neil Gorsuch with his refusal to mask. So oh, there you go. Can, no. can, can confirm both. So mm-hmm. uh, just just for an, for an example of what we're up against, take this passage out of the goddamn National Review, and I swear to God, I am not making any of this up. Quote, Americans don't like to talk about it, but we do have a ruling class, and African Americans have been in it for a while now. Uh, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking what? what? <laughs> we got we got through a clause. That, yeah, that's where we started. Yeah. We haven't even finished a fucking sentence yet. Long we enough stop to the produce. podcast there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I realize everything in the National Review needs its own record scratch accompaniment. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Uh, 
long enough to produce such a perfect specimen of the genre as Katanji Brown Jackson. Hooray for the meritocracy and all that. There isn't anything wrong with being an Ivy League educated child of privilege. Yeah, got to get that one in the National Wolf. Review. But we do not live in a country where it is particularly remarkable that a woman who grew up educated and comfortable family who attended the best schools where she met all the right people should rise to the top of her profession. That's what the Ivy League is there for. You know, you can get a good education anywhere. Yeah, Jesus, here comes the bottom half of Andrew's graduating class complaining that the only reason they're not getting the nomination is because it's just not fair to be a white guy anymore. Uh, <laughs> Jesus yeah. fucking Christ. <laughs> so so that lovely piece was written by Kevin D. Williamson, who is best known for, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up either. He wrote a cover story for the National Review back in 2012 that begins with, what do women want? And then predicted that Mitt Romney was going to get 100% of the female vote in that year's election. Wow. Really? Michelle, too. Yeah. Michelle, too. Wow. I mean, he has whole binders full of them, so it yeah. makes sense. I get it. <laughs> and if you're more than a little excitedly asking, gosh, Andrew, does that article read like barely concealed gay Mitt Romney fanfic? I can confidently tell you, break out the lube, shut the bedroom door, because this... <laughs> Is what Williamson says about our money. And yes, he calls him our money. Really? Amazing. Look at his fat stacks. Look at that mess of sons and grandchildren. Look at a picture of Ann Romney on her wedding day and that cocky smirk on our money's face. And well, okay. real quotes. <laughs> Fat stacks. Uh, but so, okay, to be fair, once he started running away from his own gubernatorial record, that was a comprehensive list of his remaining qualifications <laughs> to be president, right? Yep. Fair, fair. God, remember when we were worried that Mitt Romney might become the yeah. president? Oh, oh <laughs> monsters oh. under the bed and shadows on our bedroom wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Anyway, somewhere in between wanting to get absolutely destroyed by Willard Mitt Romney, he of the joint JD MBA from Harvard, right? The mm. most exclusive program at the most yeah. exclusive. Uh, uh, Kevin Williamson was just overcome by the epidemic of elitist harvard educated black women who have risen to the top of their various professions just like uh, 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 just uh, just like uh, <laughs> in any event judge brown jackson is an eminent jurist she's way fucking smarter than you and me and your uncle frank and you can hear us break down her most significant legal opinions on a bonus episode of opening arguments that i get to plug right here and i i for one am sincerely proud i mean this with all sincerity to witness a, a truly historic event later this year when she ascends to the supreme court yeah Amen, brother. And if you want a fun mental image, just imagine what Republicans would say if she spent her confirmation hearing scream weeping about how much she liked beer. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just imagine if she treated it the same way that asshole treated it. Uh, members of the United States Senate. And I know you're listening. Um, w one of you, please ask that question. Do you, do you like beer? I would just love it. <laughs> I need the Senate Judiciary Committee. You know you're out there. Do it for me. Raphael, you need my vote. You know you do. <laughs> I want her to tip Brett out of his chair on her first day. Just take it. <laughs> Next up in headlines in Don't Mask, Don't Tell News. I, I feel like you've used that one a lot. How dare you? No. How dare you? <laughs> so you might have missed it in the swarm of terrifying news and footage coming out of Ukraine this week, but the CDC has once again altered its recommendations on masking and social distancing. Uh, as of this past Friday, COVID is over mm. for now. Mm. Kind of. Mm. Assuming the transmission rate is low enough mm. and you're vaccinated. There you go. Uh, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. yeah yeah no it, it, honestly this update had a distinctly ah fuck it you're not doing it anyway feeling but yeah. they insist it was based on the science look i just want to know when the cdc is going to recommend that i can stop washing my fucking hands okay i had no idea how like 20 seconds 20 seconds is an eternity the water yeah. is hot <laughs> thank you so yeah, dry. so the new recommendations are based on three metrics, uh, new COVID hospitalizations, mm -hmm. hospital capacity, and new COVID-19 cases. In areas where those numbers are low, the CDC says you don't need to wear a mask. In areas where it's medium, they recommend wearing a mask if you're high risk for COVID-19. And of course, everyone should wear a mask in high risk areas and times. And 
In case you're wondering what that means in real today terms, according to them, about 70% of America could get rid of their masks today, at least according to the new recommendations. Right. And not coincidentally, the other 30% is the people who aren't going to mask up regardless of what the fucking CDC recommends, more or less. Uh, so, the, so those recommendations apply to an establishment or motor vehicle flying the Confederate flag unironically. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> Got it. Use that in place of code blue. <laughs> now, obviously, there's pushback against this new advice because it's 2022 and there's pushback against literally everything. I mean, there were literally people on Twitter calling noodles the pug ableist. Culture is broken. Okay, okay. look, if they come for pizza school, the corgi, we will have war. I mean, we have. we'll have a different war than the Yeah, okay. All right, yeah, all right. All yeah. right. So do I need to pause for an echoey rendition of first they came for noodles? <laughs> no, no, I've let it go. I've let okay. it go. But look. That's neither here nor there. There are legitimate worries about this policy, right? As Dr. Gerald Harmon, president of the American Medical Association, said in his statement to CNN, quote, even as some jurisdictions lift masking requirements, we must grapple with the fact that millions of people in the U.S. are immunocompromised, more susceptible to severe COVID outcomes, or still too young to be eligible for the vaccine. In light of those facts, I personally will continue to wear a mask in most indoor public settings, and I urge all Americans to consider doing the same, especially in places like pharmacies, grocery stores, and on public transportations, locations all of us, regardless of vaccination status or risk factors, must visit regularly, end quote. Well, you're right. Like In other words, the CDC also doesn't have an official policy against licking your hand before you reach into the fucking mint tray, you inconsiderate disease vectors. Uh, counterpoint, Noah, if you don't lick your fingers, the mints won't stick to them. Duh. Exactly. <laughs> and they don't let you take it home. That's a great visual. Double point. Yeah. Uh, and I point out that quote because... I, I think it strikes a delicate and subtle balance between the two loudest voices we're hearing right now, right? There are those who think COVID precautions should only end when cases are at a level pretty much everyone agrees they're literally never going to reach. And that if you don't do that, you hate immunocompromised people and babies and those who think the whole COVID thing has been a scam all along. And now Fauci's admitting it because JFK Jr., who was still alive, arrested him and his cellmate, Tom Hanks, is going to turn him in. And the truth is between those two extremes. And I'm not going to pretend to know where the truth is, but I'll promise you this. Anyone who tells you they know better then scientific consensus is either a brilliant scientist or wrong. Yep. There is no in between. And on that note, speaking of our oncoming disaster, let's toss to the people who can help you out with that kind of stuff. Policy genius. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. When you live a life like I do, it helps to have an Andrew Torres in your life. Eli, uh, Tony just called again. Uh, did you send the IRS a note that says no thank you instead of your taxes this year? Uh, no thank you, please. But if you don't have an Andrew Torres looking out for the unfortunate things in your life, you might want Policy Genius. Uh, Eli, did you put mango nectar in the car engine again? I was hiding it for later. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy insurance you need. Click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com and answer a few questions. Policy Genius will show you price estimates for policies that fit your search and help you understand your options. The Policy Genius team can look for ways to save you more money. And if they find a better rate than what you're paying now, they'll switch you over for free. Customers who bundled their home and auto policies with Policy Genius saved an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying. Oh, uh, yeah, that reminds me. We still need to pay that fine from the FCC for what you called into the local radio station. Okay, in my defense, she should have been way more specific about what kind of requests she was looking for. And best of all, the Policy Genius team works for you, not insurance companies. You can trust them to offer unbiased help and advocate for you at every step until you're covered. Head to policygenius.com to get your free home and auto insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Oh, speaking of save, the pizza guy is still trapped under the car. Oh, yeah, let, let's go. Let's go get him out. Uh, you, you think he'll sign an NDA? N no. No, I don't think. I don't think he'll do that yeah. either. Yeah. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Shoot the Moon News. <laughs> I have a correction to make for a story that we talked about on episode 166. 
I covered a report that had come out a few days earlier by astronomer Bill Gray that suggested a SpaceX rocket stage was going to crash into the moon later this week. And I actually framed the whole story around SpaceX being fuck ups and contrasting that with NASA's flawless launch and deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, spoiler alert, that's still a super good take. Well, yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, like, so the report we got last week is that it isn't actually a SpaceX rocket stage. Uh, so that changes the tone of things a bit. But like to Andrew's point, there's still a SpaceX rocket stage that was inefficiently launched, hurling around fuck knows where in space. The fact that we don't know where it is and that it <laughs> isn't accidentally crashing into the moon doesn't make shit better. But it turns out that this rogue rocket stage actually comes from a 2014 launch by the Chinese Space Agency. Wow, Noah, as someone who's reporting on this, and I'll just say it, all of our shows has been without flaw. I can't help but think that this mistake of yours has risen as a kind of chimera to tear apart our shows. <laughs> yes, it could be very well. Okay, now, to this point, uh, China is officially denying responsibility and claiming that it's just some other dude's rocket stage that kind of looks like theirs. Uh, but there's a non-zero chance China will someday officially deny being China. So uh -huh. I, I'm not sure how much stock we can put in that. Like, I, I'm hesitant to say they're wrong because, like, two episodes back, I was pretty confident it was Elon Musk's leftovers. But the astronomer who originally misidentified it put out a detailed blog post about why he got it wrong. And then a group of students from the University of Arizona did a spectral analysis that revealed the material makeup of the object. And apparently Chinese rocket stage was the best fit for the results. Uh, but it's I, like we can't zoom in on it and check the fucking license plate. So there's no way to know for sure. I mean, at this point, maybe we give them the full Nate Silver and, you know, just don't listen to them anymore. Like, oh, but I'm I'm good at my job, technically. Oh, not when it mattered. Get a day job. Boo, nerd. Boo. No. no. So, so seriously, uh, and and point point to you, Noah. It's actually re relatively easy to figure out how this kind of mistake got made. Um, for the better part of a decade, Chinese public and private firms have been actively copying SpaceX's designs yeah. to try and close the gap between their space program and ours. Right. So the Chinese Long March Two C rocket, for example, is virtually identical in design to SpaceX's Falcon 9. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Makes this kind of detective work almost impossible. Now, it's worth noting that China has a notoriously lackadaisical attitude towards <laughs> their space detritus. I, I mean, so does every country with the capacity to launch shit into space. But but China's uh, like a notorious cosmic litter bug, even by that standard, and has been for a while. You'll recall back in November when they deorbited a 23-ton Long March 5B rocket stage with the, you know, fingers crossed method and avoided <laughs> killing people because there just didn't happen to be any people there where it crashed. Um, and of course, there was also that time back in 2007 when the ISS literally had to make evasive maneuvers uh -huh. to avoid the space debris that China created by blowing up a satellite with a missile to see what that would look like. Yep. Right. So like accidentally crashed from shit into the moon would certainly be in keeping with their M.O. Yeah, slamming shit into the moon, voting present in the NATO vote to condemn Russia. Real chaotic neutral vibe China's running with this month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in, uh, sure, he's a giant douchebag, but at least Elon Musk can occasionally be shamed on Twitter news. Uh, th th that, that thing I just said. <laughs> Andrew, would you like to use don't mask, don't tell instead? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. All right. So look, first, Elon Musk is, in fact, a giant douchebag, right? Mm. I'm going to quote from an article by researcher Nathan J. Robinson in the April 7th, 2021 issue of Current Affairs. And yes, this is actual evidence my son cut for one of his debate cases that he really reads in those rounds. Quote, nice. Elon Musk is a liar, huckster, and moron who regularly says things so ignorant that I cannot understand how they come from a human adult, let alone one treated by his fans as a super genius. His takes on the COVID-19 pandemic make Donald Trump look like the dean of Harvard Medical School. Musk predicted that by April 2020, there would be zero daily cases and said that kids are essentially immune to the disease gets better when a group of thai school children were stuck in a cave mm -hmm. musk not only pretended that he would personally save the children with a special mini submarine uh he did not uh, but smeared one of the actual cave rescuers as a pedophile yes this actually happened 
Yeah, no, to be clear, the problems with pretending we have a meritocracy aren't all at the low end of the income <laughs> spectrum, yeah. right? And he said all that without mentioning the haircut, folks. So. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And finally, my personal favorite, quote, one former environmental compliance manager was told by the safety team at Tesla that Elon does not like the color yellow as an explanation for the failure to put out brightly colored warnings. He what? also didn't like too many signs or the warning beeps forklifts make when backing up. These are real quotes, people. What? And, and these preferences, quote, led to cutting back on those standard safety signals. Jesus. End of actual research. Fucking Christ. In other words, the reason Eli was wrong about Tesla's stock is that people are dumber than he was giving them credit for. Hey, wrong for now. If you never sell your short, then you're proven right by the heat death of the universe. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and I need to talk about short, short positions offline. Yeah, uh, and the timeline, that. sure. No, sure. All right, so look, that's the bad part. You want part. some Bitcoin, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> What's the good part? The good part is... <laughs> is that SpaceX is flinging tens of thousands of cheap satellites into low Earth orbit, where they've greatly increased the risk that they will collide with other satellites, including secret military satellites, and potentially unleash a cascade of horrible events that is called the Kessler Effect, and yes, we have a name for it, uh, that could trigger World War... Four? I, I, oh, anyway, yeah, right. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> a, a world Christ. war. Yeah. Uh, but but if we're lucky, it could just effectively end space exploration and make weather satellites a fun thing we can tell our grandkids about. Eh, say what you will, Noah, but I miss the days of checking the weather by asking grandpappy about his knee. You know, that was... <laughs> All right, Good you're to know. you're skeptical of that being good news to to hear to hear Musk tell it. This mega constellation of satellites is it's called Starlink, and it will deliver rural broadband service to the rural poor in the United States, and eventually across the entire digital South to underserved areas of humanity where internet would indeed be life changing. Um, that promise would be why the FCC gave Elon Musk nearly a billion dollars to develop Jesus. and deploy Starlink. And if you're wondering, does it actually do that? I could refer you to researcher S. Derek Turner's December 2020 report, Broadband Boondoggle, Agent Pi's $886 million gift to Elon Musk, which maybe gives away the punchline. Yeah, but, I mean, but on the bright side, it ruined astrophotography, so at least we have that. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, so what Turner did was looked at each and every specific grant to Starlink. That, that, that you could do a boo nerds right here, right? To uh, construct terminals and deploy internet. Internet that was, remember in Musk's words, designed to serve, quote, the hardest to reach rural Americans, end of quote. Turns out, now, now let's go to the research. Some of these areas are just empty plots of land. Some are parking lots. Some are blocks entirely occupied by large enterprises like airports or universities, oh which, which self-provision their own Internet access. Yeah, the conclusion <laughs> is a significant portion of the billion dollars Musk received in subsidies is to serve urban airports, parking lots and dog parks. Jesus. Okay, but but on the upside, 5G now stands for five very good boys. Oh, well, there you <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah, well, except I'm on board. Uh, okay, but now here's the final twist. Ukraine's 31-year-old first vice prime minister took to Twitter the other day to try and shame Elon Musk with a tweet that read, Elon Musk, while you try to colonize Mars, Russia tries to colonize to occupy Ukraine. While your rockets successfully land from space, Russian rockets attack Ukrainian civil people. We ask you to provide Ukraine with Starlink stations and to address sane Russians to stand down. And it worked. Within hours, Musk activated Starlink in Ukraine and replied via Twitter that more terminals are en route. And that's a great thing. Uh, unless he's lying like he was about that mini sub mm -hmm. yeah don't, don't worry i'm squatting on prime minister what's his name is a pedophile and i'm going to charge him so much doge going for it when he wants it so. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> and finally tonight in state of the union news my grandma betty was not a smart woman. She placed last in family Scrabble games in spite of still being allowed two-letter words long after all the children in the family aged out of the privilege. She once asked me if they put marijuana in the pizza at Pizza Hut to make them taste better. Well, would that, would that make it taste better? Yeah, yeah. And her last uh, words to me I, were, a lot to don't learn. put off till tomorrow what you could do today, which, <laughs> as far as last words go, is pretty unimpressive. But 
There was one thing even Betty Bosnick knew, and that's that the only thing worse than a workplace with a union is a workplace without one. Which is why I'm pleased to announce that the union organizers overwhelmingly won a vote on Friday to represent workers at a Starbucks in Mesa, Arizona, giving them their third win in an effort to organize the sector. Yeah, and remember, boys and girls, when you vote against unionization, you're not just voting against your own self-interest, you're voting against your ability to vote in favor of your own self-interest in the future. Yeah, but don't worry. If you sue, I'm sure that the Supreme Court will apply the same logic it has to gerrymandering cases, where if you want change, you should vote. For, all right, nice. <laughs> oh. withdrawn. Yeah. So the union, Starbucks Workers United, has already won the right to represent workers at two stores in Buffalo, New York, and has filed to hold elections at more than 100 Starbucks across 26 states. In other words, if all goes right, the union is coming to my four pump blonde roast peppermint mocha with soy milk. No whip made it 110 degrees. Yes, you can be that specific. You have to hit the temperature and then other and then you use the arrow. Oh, button. Jesus. You can't just Christ. press warm, which is 120 degrees. And the only thing more delicious than that <laughs> is the tears of anti-union assholes who are mad about it. Oh, for fuck's sake, Eli is a walking barista <laughs> union grievance, and even he's in favor exactly. of this shit. <laughs> Help them rise up against me. Now, <laughs> I, I should point out that this is still a tiny fraction of Starbucks in these states, right? CNN, where I read this story, estimates there are around 9,000 Starbucks in the U.S., Jesus. but 100 is a start. And it's already seeing effects. So Starbucks preemptively said it would raise wages to 15 an hour for baristas, with most hourly employees earning an average of nearly 17 an hour by the summer. And make no mistake, they're doing that preemptively because when the union asks if they say no, the answer is a strike. Right. Yes, this is a union victory. And let me say in advance that if and when Starbucks decides to sacrifice these locations on the altar of capitalism, it does not then follow that the union got them shut down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, th this is the Amazon playbook, too, right? So step one is get threatened by unions. Step two is drastically raise your pay rates. Step three is argue that the employees don't need a union because they've already gotten a pay rise. Mm -hmm. And then yep. step four, fund gaslighting politicians and argue in public that you know the unions don't really do anything because all of our employees are already getting paid yeah. right and i know it's easy to write off these three unionizing coffee shops as outliers but the potential for union break into the restaurant business which according to cnn only has 1.6 percent of its workforce unionized is huge it's momentous it's economy changing yeah no, and in an industry where just hang out in the dining room and then clock in when we get busy is very often the standard. It's also life changing. Uh, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, don't don't forget the oh sure we could look into those overtime claims, but then we'd have to take a real hard look at your I nine forms. Yes, and, uh, you don't want that, do you, Luis? Yeah, right. Yeah. And look, I brought up that bit at the beginning about my grandma Betty, despite what my mother will tell you, not just to insult her memory, but to close <laughs> with a little bit of a story. When my grandma was 19 years old, she had a good job at Sears Department Store as a sales girl. And in spite of the very real fear of losing that job, her Sears was the very first store in the United States to join the Garment Workers Union. And she was the very first one of its workers to vote for it, waking up, at least according to her, two hours early so she could take the train down and be first in line. She kept her Sears name tag for the rest of her life. And when she died, it's one of the few things that I kept. That's how proud she was of what she'd done. And look, I don't know shit about Dick. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you know my political predictions are some kind of antimatter. But <laughs> there may come a time soon at your job, be it Starbucks or Sears or wherever the fuck you work, where it comes time to decide whether you want a union. And when that time comes, I hope you're as smart as my grandma Betty. And on that note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Eli Bosnick, thanks to Andrew Torres, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us on Facebook, followed us on Twitter, and sent us e feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money on our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the people that Heath is going to thank by name on the next episode, yes, I could do it, but we all agree I think that Heath love is worth the wait. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes for your charge, check out our brother and sister 
sister shows, The Skidding Alias, Scott Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, and all of the other podcast apps. Or the deep web, apparently. Uh, we just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Drafts on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. That sounded like Roger fucking Rabbit. I'm sorry. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.